Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Transcelerate public webinar. Is your RWD regulatory ready? Considerations when preparing RWD for a regulatory submission. Okay, next slide, please. Our agenda today will cover um, some basic logistics and ground rules. Um, we'll get right into background and overview of the solution and spend a good portion of the time with our expert panel discussion and Q&A. Next slide. Some logistics for today's webinar. Note that all participants will be muted on the call to ensure pleasant listening experience for everyone. Um, you can reduce the GoToWebinar control panel for a better view of the presentation by clicking on the orange and white arrows in the upper right-hand corner. We welcome questions throughout the discussion. These can be submitted using the questions function you see on the control panel. Be sure to click send when you type your question in the box. Um, if your question is not answered through the Q&A um, online in writing, we will um, try to um, answer it afterwards if you want to send it through an email. Um, and as a reminder um, and final piece of information, this webinar is being recorded and we do intend to provide the recording and the materials out to all those who registered. Okay, next slide, we'll cover a bit of ground rules for today. Um, we just want to make sure this discussion is helpful and answer as many questions as we possibly can. So first of all, we want to note that participation is voluntary in the webinar and in use of the Transcelerate assets and solutions. Um, regarding compliance, the responsibility for compliance with laws and regulations is owned by the solution adopter. Um, you do not have to identify what company you work for when, when posting questions today. Um, things we would ask you not to discuss or, or post about, um, what vendors and sites and CROs companies are using or not using, any issues company have, have with the vendors, sites or CROs, um, long-term development plans, or anything related to pricing or costs. Um, and to let you know, our panelists cannot answer questions um, about specific vendors with whom member companies are working, costs of using or implementing Transcelerate assets or tools, or which member companies are uh, adopters. Um, specific on the next web on the next slide, specific to this webinar, um, we want to call out where relevant. Transcelerate has reference applicable guidance and regulations. It's very very key to this topic. However. Um, the material that follows and the team's papers are not intended to serve as regulatory guidance themselves or legal advice. Companies are still responsible for drawing their own conclusions from regulatory guidance and ensuring compliance with relevant laws and regulation. The team purposefully did not um, confine itself to relevant FDA guidances and definitions, but also considered publications from other regulators in the hopes that the paper would be useful to global stakeholders. The material that follows in the team's paper are not intended to be prescriptive or dictate a particular approach or, or one size fits all solution. Instead, the team's work is intended to help companies consider what might be relevant and build viable approaches through partnerships between sponsors and vendors. On the next slide, I'll just um, back up and tell you a little bit about Transcelery. We are a not-for-profit entity created to foster collaboration. Um, our mission is to collaborate across the global biopharmaceutical R&D community to identify, prioritize, and design, facilitate the implementation of solutions designed to drive the efficient, effective, and high-quality delivery of new medicines. Next slide, please. Since 20, 2012, quite a while now, passionate leaders and subject matter experts from our Transcelerate family of companies have volunteered their time to design, develop, deliver, and socialize solutions to advance our mission. Transcelerate has designed and developed over 400 tools um, to address the R&D ecosystem pain points and, and really provide transformational opportunities. A uh, majority of the solutions are available for, for public use and download on the Transcelerate website. Um, one more slide for me. Um, I just want to acknowledge the incredible contribution over the number of years in this project across um, some key contributors. Um, here we have a list of the folks who are currently very active on the team, um, delivering the solutions to the final stages. But I also want to acknowledge our legacy contributors who had, you know, the vision and and the um, the effort and the expertise to really guide the solution. So thank you to all of our all of our contributors on this project. And with that, I'm going to stop talking and turn it over to Abby Seifert. Um, she is our initiative leader for real world data audit readiness considerations. And Abby is the global head, um, country development quality at Novartis. Abby, I'll turn it to you. 
Great, thanks Stacy, and hopefully you can hear me. Um, we'll just go to the next slide, please. Um, so, so I wanted to start today's talk with level setting, um, the working definitions that we use for real world evidence and real world data. Real world data is that data that's gathered through the delivery, delivery of routine healthcare and can be collected via a variety of sources, um, including EHR or insurance claims, that kind of thing. Real world evidence is actually the clinical evidence that's produced by aggregating that real world data and helps to demonstrate the potential benefits or risks of a product. Now, there's numerous documented potential uses on this slide uh, for real world evidence and real world data. Our working team focused on the lower right hand corner uh, of the box set, specifically how real world data and evidence can be used to support regulatory decision making. Um, if we go to the next slide, uh, the objective of the ARC team or the Audit Readiness Considerations team was to build a set of parameters that allowed us to operationalize the thought leadership of Duke Margolis um, and FDA and EMA, among others, uh, to support the oversight of real world evidence quality in the context of regulatory decision making. So we we're very specific to that regulatory decision making use case. Um, in addition, the considerations um, create kind of a basis for mutual understanding of the possible documentation needed um, when, when you're pursuing a submission uh, using real world evidence. So our goal, as Stacy said earlier, wasn't to codify a set of requirements, but to br really bring forward the best practices that we found in the literature and help interpret available guidance to help uh, providers and users of real world data better demonstrate that the real world evidence generated in support of the regulatory decision making process is really fit for purpose. So if we go to the next slide, um, the team has launched two solutions. Um, if you use the QR code here, it will take you right to the Transcelerate website. Um, and these are the two solutions. It's really our white paper and then an infographic. On the next slide, uh, so, so when we were done re reviewing the literature, we really kind of found that there were two big buckets in common across the reviewed papers. Those buckets are data relevance and data reliability. Underneath those buckets are five key concepts that we term pillars that we defined as relevance, accrual, provenance, completeness, and accuracy. These are aligned to the terminologies published by FDA and Duke Margolis. Um, EMA and MHRA is also very much aligned with this. And at the end of the day, we felt in order to appropriately drive health authority confidence in, in the use of real world data sources in that regulatory context, we would need to be able to show via documentation the processes used to record, collect, aggregate, and report that data. So I'm not going to go into detail about this on this slide. I, I will go to the next slide, though, and, and orient you to the way we set up our paper. So we set up our paper in underneath the five pillars. Um, and the next two slides cover the intended purpose of each consideration pillar. First, relevance. So relevance really kind of answers the question, are the data that you're using robust and representative of the patient population you're studying? Um, as a part of the considerations, we felt that um, companies should be able to explain how the data are representative of that study population and also be able to show that the data covers an appropriate time frame time frame. In other words, longitudinally, longitudinally do, do the number of patient years kind of line up with what your hypothesis is in your protocol. Under accrual, um, accrual really kind of describes the aggregation process or the selection of data. It asks you to consider defining and documenting what methods were used to collect and aggregate that data. And this is really about documenting how your process was conducted. Um, what are the associated data quality checks you use to be able to recreate what you did and show that you produce high quality data. If you look at 
the considerations in and of themselves. In many cases, the health authorities and MHRA actually and specifically has called out the protocol as a really good place to start to answer some of these questions, to talk about the process that you use to collect and aggregate the data, what you expected. Um, data handling plans are also another great place to document what you did and how you did it. Um, as, as you go forward in your, in your process. On the next slide, we talk about the, the final three pillars. The first one is provenance. And, and again, this is the origin or the traceability of the data through from the analysis data set all the way back to the original data. So, so in the GCP world, um, many health authorities will want to look at your source data. We find that the that the purpose of what we're doing here probably is no different because the use case is for regulatory decision making. So helping to follow and understand that virtual audit trail of how you got from the original patient data set all the way up to your analysis data set is gonna be important for you to help, help understand the reliability of your data. And then under completeness, um, your definitions and processes can illustrate what's needed and what would be expected um, in the data set. For example, how is the missing data handled? In other words, did you have any missing data? Did it impact um, your associated endpoint? Uh, um, were there checks in, that you had in place in order to uh, overcome the, the missing data and, and the impact of that missing data? And then finally, accuracy. Accuracy really talks to the degree to which your data is correct, consistent, and unambiguous. How did you perform the data corrections, if any, and what processes were used to follow um, and facilitate that accuracy? So, so those kind of in a nutshell are our pillars. Um, and and as, as we kind of go through this webinar on the next slide, I, I'm kind of switching gears now and talking about um, the development process for the, for the considerations white paper, what we, what we did and how we did it. On the next slide, first, first we defined our scope. Um, any good scientific research, you define your scope and what you expect you want to do. Um, so the scope of our real-world data audit readiness initiative took into account the generation and aggregation of data to create the research data set. We actually stopped short of the analytics and study reporting of submission because we felt that those were adequately covered across a lot of the literature that we found. The questions we then answered were really geared towards identifying how a data vendor or a sponsor would prove that the resultant data set was fit for purpose or fit for use in the context of regulatory decision making. On the next slide, this, this really kind of is, is an illustration of the steps we took to develop the content um, and get feedback and generate the final paper and infographic. Our timeline here reveals a bit more about the time and effort needed to get to the final product. You can see we started in 2021, right in the height of COVID, um, and ended at the end of, uh, pardon me, 2023. Um, but it also gives you an idea of the concurrency of the papers that were available to us in the public space at the outset of our work. So not, note that a lot of the activity um, in the public space or the publication of papers from health authorities and, and other major thought leaders have been released kind of in this in the past year. So from, from the beginning of 2023 on to, on to today. As we reviewed those more recent publications now, we, we really feel that our considerations are very much aligned with the, with the concept and the process by which, um, by which those papers are, are kind of pointing. So if I go to the next slide, I mentioned the literature review was conducted on the documents uh, in the, available in the public space at the time. We reviewed over 40 publications. We actually, we actually um, reviewed quite a few more than those things, but those 40 publications were the seminal documents that we used to reference as we put our, um, as we put our paper together. 
The review is really geared towards understanding the commonalities and terminologies and the thought process to get from a real world data point to a real world evidence data set. And then we constructed the initial framework for our considerations. On the next slide, I, once we once we formulated our um, draft considerations, we went out to data service providers um, via a survey. Um, and, and so this was a key part of our development pro pro process. We, we sent a survey to data service providers and the insights gathered from the data service providers directly inform the content of the white paper. We really wanted to answer what are the questions that folks have in in this environment and what are the types of things that we kind of need to address as as we go forward with our paper and our considerations um, to review these insights that you're seeing on this slide i know it's a very a very jam-packed slide we encourage you to go and check out our infographic at the at the qr code that we exposed earlier we also wanted to thank the, the data service provider community who completed the survey and, and really provided this critical feedback at a place that we really needed it to improve the context of the white paper. So thanks for that. On the next slide, so, so we went to data service providers, we went back, we went back to the drawing board, we started, we, um, we, put another draft of our paper together, and then we went out for public review of the considerations. We did that at the end of, um, at the end of 2022 into 2023. And it, the public review um, revealed um, about 20, 250 comments uh, on the paper. Uh, we took into account 100% of those comments, um, and we actioned about 50% of those comments. Now, we wanted to thank everybody at this point for for taking the time to provide those insightful comments and provide the helpful helpful feedback during the public review. Like I said, we were able to action a majority of the comments and found them to be really, again, key insights in improving the paper, making it more clear, making the language more um, more acceptable, and picking up on, on gaps that, that you saw. When comments weren't actioned, usually it was because the comment was beyond the scope or remit of the paper. And um, honestly, I think we, at this point, um, in the development process are done. Um, we're talking about what to do next, but we also encourage other groups to consider picking up where the team left off. So at this point, um, I know I sped through those slides. Uh, I wanted to get back to our panel, so I'm gonna pass back to Stacy Teagan, our moderator for the expert panel session. Thank you. Thanks, Abby. That was a great overview of the solution, and hopefully folks are excited to go look at the assets on the website. Um, now we do turn to, I think, most exciting and interesting part is we're going to hear from a series of experts. Um, if you want to flip to the next slide, um, I will just share that the, the responses that our experts um, will give today um, are a res result of many conversations among the panelists, among the team, um, do not necessarily represent their individual views or, or their respective organizations. Um, but I think you're going to find this very informative. Um, so with that, I'm going to introduce you to our panelists who have all come on screen. Thank you all. Um, you've met Abby Stiefert. I'd also like to introduce Gracie Crane. Gracie is the International Regulatory Policy Lead, um, particularly in RWD and Data Policy for Roche. And Nicole Mahoney, Executive Director, U.S. Regulatory Policy and Intelligence in Novartis. Gracie, Nicole, and Abby have worked together over the last number of years and, and of course with others to build these solutions. I'd also like to introduce Alison Kafshimoka, who is our Chief Operating Officer here at Transcelerate. Prior to joining Transcelerate, she led product and strategy for Optum Life Sciences. Um, so I think we have a great panel for you today. What will they be talking about? We are lucky to have received um, quite a number of questions through the registration process. So thank you all for providing some direction for our discussion today. If you do have a question as we're going through today, you can put it also in the Q&A panel, the question panel within GoToWebinar. 
Um, we may not get to all of your questions today, so you can also um, email to us and we'll provide the email address later. Okay, so now we are going to dig in and I'm going to start with you, Gracie. Um, can you help baseline us on what is meant by regulatory grade RWE generation? And are there any real examples of early adopters using RWD within regulatory submissions? Ah, oh, thanks so much, Stacey. This is the, the uh, you know, the, the, the big question, isn't it? What is regulatory grade uh, real world data? Um, so I think one of the things that would, is always good is to look at the guidances. I mean, we have plenty of guidances from, uh, from the FDA, we've got guidances from EMA and, and loads of others as well, depending on the region that you're, you're, you're based in. But also, um, you know, this, these kind of guidances do help us understand the expectations from the regulators. Because obviously, you know, they, they look at it from a regulatory decision-making point of view. Uh, you know, they're looking in some instances to inform the benefit risk assessment. So, you know, it's really important that those guidances from the regulators are, are, are being consulted. Um, the, the considerations document that we presented is of course a list of key considerations uh, for, uh, for data quality. And it, it obviously, as Abby explained, it focuses on uh, relevance and, and reliability. Now the purpose is to add greater clarity as to the type of um, you know, information and also the documentation uh, that you know, the regulators would seek. Now, if you look at figure two, it, it actually is really great in, in within the document it actually explains the type of documentation that you need and you know i would urge everybody to kind of take a look at that and it's a, it's a very informative figure in my opinion um, and of course then the, the the other thing that i just wanted to mention is you know this this document obviously needs to be used in conjunction with the guidances as well so it's it's you know it's always it's always good to have a multi-layered uh, kind of um, way of, of informing your decisions and maybe and to the second part of your question about early adopters i think this is a, such a rich and continuous continuous learning environment so we know that you know there are plenty of examples there i mean you can there are publications you know several publications from both the fda and ema on um, you know on the on their on the examples where they have used real world real world where they have looked uh, you know looked at real world data from um, from companies. Uh, there's also obviously many conferences. I think you know and and these proceedings are all available online. And I believe Nicole, you also flagged, which was really helpful, that there are there is going to be a report as well from uh, from the FDA. Um, as part of the, um, in fact, later this month, I think you believe you flagged that. So that's really helpful, something for us to all keep an eye out for. Um, and then um, towards the tail end of last year, EMA published their, um, their booklet, if you like, on how they've used real world data for um, regulatory decision making. Um, so, you know, there, there's kind of plenty uh, of, of information out there. And of course, uh, we as drug developers are also encouraged to kind of you know publish as well so uh yeah so it's really rich <laughs> in fact it's you know you you almost can't keep up with the amount of information uh, out there so you know do do look out for all of these and uh yeah and thanks for the question stacy yeah I, I love all the examples of the collaboration and sharing right it, it's it's learning from each other because every situation is unique yeah, yeah. Um, we'll stick to the regulatory theme. I'll turn maybe to Nicole and then Gracie, feel free to jump in as well. Um, so the considerations that you all have generated, are they mapped to RWD guidances from specific regulators? Yes, and I think that um, Gracie mentioned this and also, of course, Abby, but uh, with respect to the overlap um, between what we did and what regulators did, our work was actually very much informed by existing um, guidance and regulation. So I think that the goal is to use what we've produced in conjunction 
um, with the regulatory guidance. And you have to think about what is applicable for the particular use case that you're thinking about. And as Gracie mentioned, we have a number of use cases to actually refer to through conferences, uh, published literature, reports that the regulators are, are have put out or will put out. And I think that um, you'll find that there's a nice alignment there. Of what we really tried to focus on was documentation of the processes, procedures, and evidence that's available to demonstrate relevance and reliability. And again, I think there's a, a nice overlap between what regulators have published and the uh, considerations document that we published. Okay. So, Abby, I'll turn to you. This question comes in, and it's more about how do we use the, the tool. Um, so I'll read the comment. The paper aims to translate data quality considerations into a functional format. Um, the considerations are thoroughly detailed, but to foster adoption, we suggest Transcelerate consider using a more user-friendly format, such as a checklist. So can you speak to, to that, that connotation of checklist versus consideration and how one might use it? Yeah, thanks, Stacey. I I, I think first and foremost, we acknowledge that this would probably be helpful, but after after careful consideration and discussions with regulators, we went with the current format to allow for more flexibility in the use of the audit readiness considerations document. So a checklist tends to be um, construed as providing a one-size-fits-all solution um, where, where every box needs to be checked. Um, but users of the considerations should be able to pull out or leave in um, those considerations that are not relevant for the use case that they're contemplating. And, and honestly, being, being from QA, I think the last thing we want to do is, is give an auditor or an inspector something that they can say, you didn't check that box, so therefore you didn't complete the task. I think, I think the task is, is best known by the folks that, that are using that, that use case or putting forward that use case and can, can really kind of help dictate what they want to do and what processes they want to expose to a regulator or an auditor. Yeah. Yeah, thank, thank you, Abby. Um, Allison, I'm going to flip it over to you. Um, <clears throat> thinking about how would one ensure reliability when the sponsor doesn't necessarily have control of the data, um, meaning the way it's collected and analyzed? Great question, Stacy. And I'll give a short answer and a long answer. Um, the short answer is it's got to be through partnership. Um, and the longer answer in the, the context of that is, you know, at Transcelerate, we recognize that the compliance burden does rest primarily with a sponsor. Um, but satisfying the compliance requirements is going to require support and sponsorship from other stakeholders, whether they be sites, data, technology vendors. There's a lot depending on the data that you're using because there are so many parties that are often involved in the generation of real world data and real world evidence. And so with this document, what we're trying to do is outline those considerations regarding data quality but we can't assign who was responsible for specific tasks because that is going to vary. And I know that's you know a hard answer, but that's the truth of it. Every data set is going to be different because it's going to be fit for purpose. Um, so as a result, you know, sponsors and the, the data service providers are going to have to work in collaboration to define for that specific use case what is necessary um, and who is going to do what. And so you know, it's just to get back to my initial answer, it's just an, an opportunity for data service providers and partners um, and sponsors to continue to collaborate and partner to get um, to do the things that are necessary to make that data set be um, regulatory ready. Just to add, to if I may, yeah. uh, you know, I think the goal is really to build trust. And I think there's a sentiment amongst a lot of stakeholders that if we um, all work together and kind of work off of a, a core set of principles on the factors that help engender trust and ensure that or help um, determine that data are fit for purpose, you know, that will really help the entire community and be a tool to help us work together. Completely agree, Nicole. Great point. Yeah. And also, it, actually, Nicole's point just reminded me, you know, that the trust, uh, you know, is key. And also what builds trust is transparency. 
Yes. And, you know, this tool kind of brings everybody onto the same page and says, you know, this is what, you know, as sponsors we need and this is, you know, how can the data providers, you know, what what documentation do you have that can help us? So I think the, the two, you know, kind of the trust and the transparency really uh, are enabled through, through this tool, I think. So I just wanted to add that in as well. Well, I mean, it's funny, Gracie, if you think about the foundations of any good partnership, it requires trust and transparency, whether it's a partnership around regulatory grade, real world data and evidence, or any kind of partnership, and the same is going to carry through on this. Agree. Yeah, great, great dialogue. Abby, maybe, you know, taking that a step further and wearing your quality hat, um, when it comes down to the items in the in the considerations and the paper, who from a sponsor land is actually responsible? <laughs> yeah, wow. So, you know, yes, I'll, I'll put on my QA hat for a second and, and say in the context of a submission, the data processes and tools used to develop the final conclusions that, you, that you're submitting to, to a health authority are subject to those regulations governing the submission. Um, FDA has actually gone so far as to say if you're if you are submitting um, under under an NDA or an IND, you absolutely need to um, adhere to Part 312. And and so and so is this is the case, then then you have to assume that the sponsor is ultimately responsible for assuring that the the quality of the data is is at at the level that it can leave no doubt that it's reliable. Um, but there's also appropriate documentation in place that allows the regulators um, to understand that the real world data, real world evidence is fit for purpose. You know, you have you have that trail, that that process trail. Yeah. Thanks, Abby. That's great guidance. Um, maybe now we'll think about the lens of the different stakeholders that are you know, involved here who need the trust and transparency across. Um, maybe Nicole, first to you from a from a regulator perspective. Um, have you engaged directly with regulators about the considerations? And if so, what aspects were they most interested? What feedback did you receive? Sure. So as Abby mentioned, we developed this tool in a stepwise fashion. We started with the literature review to identify key quality concepts. So we already baked in uh, what the regulators were uh, publishing on uh, at that time and different stakeholders were, were thinking about in terms of data quality and how you demonstrate that. Um, we also surveyed data providers to get their views on what would be feasible for an audit readiness tool. We didn't want to make assumptions on that um, in terms of what would be available to demonstrate reliability and relevance of data. And then we shared those findings with a select few regulators um, through direct conversations and direct meetings. Um, we also had uh, some opportunities for um, replying to regulatory uh, consultations on guidance that the regulators themselves put out. Um, so, you know, as we mentioned, um, we also had a public consultation ourselves on this document and made the regulators aware that they could um, weigh in on it. Um, the kind of feedback that we got was a great interest in understanding, especially the results of the survey from data service providers on what's feasible, what their thinking is, and, and what they were looking for. And one thing we conveyed was that the regulators have a really important role to play in terms of making it clear um, what the expectations are about real world data quality. Having that um, information can help data service providers understand the processes and procedures they need to put in place. Um, we were also uh, told that they are interested in this tool that we developed. Um, and specifically for um, EMA, we received feedback that they will use that to inform um, the writing of their real world data quality framework. Of course, we can expect that this will be the only tool um, that's kind of contemplated and looked at. There are many out there. And I think a key take home message should be that people really have to use this tool in conjunction with other available guidance and frameworks and really find the right approach for the specific context of use where you're trying to submit real world data for regulatory decisions. It has to be fit for purpose. 
That's very helpful, Nicole. And I think um, continuing on that regulatory theme, the regulators do play a key role, obviously, and, and you mentioned here around setting policy, establishing guidances. Um, and then there is also uh, the inspection aspect, and we have regulators who perform inspection. And, and maybe could you speak to, did the regulators weigh in on, on the considerations with specific regard to inspection readiness? So I think it's really regulatory authorities that are best positioned to um, answer the question about uh, inspection readiness. They definitely see the value of understanding what types of documentation can support the reliability and relevance um, of, of any data source and um, you know, made that clear. And what we produce is aligned with the regulators' current thinking um, to the best of our knowledge. So I think what I would recommend people do is to, you know, avail themselves of information that regulators have discussed publicly. Um, I know, for example, that FDA has been at DIA, um, and this has been captured in the trade press and the pink sheet, um, talking about their experience with regulatory um, inspections of real world data. And we're also hopeful that we might get more information about that um, when they publish their experience, uh, aggregated experience with real world data later this month as part of the FDA user fee commitments that they made. So I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Maybe let's now turn our, our attention to the lens of the data services, data service providers. And, and Allison, I'll um, share this question with you from one of the registrants. Um, considering that data service provider perspective, what are some of the most significant challenges encountered in documenting the reliability of our WD and how do the transcellular considerations address these challenges? And there is a, there is a two part here. There's another, another piece. Um, and additionally, what strategies are recommended for overcoming resistance within the organizations that may be hesitant to adopt these new practices? That's a, a great question, Stacey. And the first one I went part of the question around the challenges. I wish I had a straightforward answer to that. You know, the challenges vary um, dramatically depending on the data you're using and all of that. Um, but I th let's just focus more on the second part with like what are the strategies and what have we learned um, for overcoming some of the uh, some of this. And you know, based on our survey, we believe that probably the number one um, strategy is clear regulatory expectations. Um, I think that would make if, if the data service providers have very clear expectations from regulators, I think that they would feel more comfortable sharing information because they would know exactly what they needed to provide. Um, and again, it's, uh, my, my response here really pulls on the themes that we've already talked about, about the need for transparency and trust and strong collaboration, not just between sponsors and the data service providers, but also with the regu uh, regulators because we believe that by working together, if you can allow the auditors and inspectors to look at the documentation covering the various methodologies that are used to collect the data, to analyze, report it, um, and those are like all those steps that lead up to the regulatory decision making, then sponsors and other consumers of the real world data would then have more trust in the data so that they would feel more comfortable expanding use of the data. And so you just get into this sort of virtual cycle where we really begin to get to the, I think the end state that we're, we're all aspired to is high quality data that's being used um, uh, across the board in regulatory decisions. And so again, it goes back to some of those um, fundamental, fundamental things that we talked about previously of just comfort with transparency and trust, and I think bringing regulators into that. Thank you, Allison. Um, during the, the public comment period, we did get a, a comment in from a Davis service provider. Um, would clarify the specific ties to regulations and guidance documents for the components identified. Um, a more detailed template would be a plus. Um, so Gracie, maybe I, I would ask you, as since you were part of this work, um, has Transcellary considered mapping to specific guidance documents? And actually, um, and just to say, yes, absolutely. I think we haven't, we've kind of used the guidances that are available in order to be able to inform the tool. But of course, you know, the direct mapping hasn't, hasn't been done. 
because you know at the point also at the point when this was launched you know there were some guidances available but obviously there are a lot more guidances available now so i think this is kind of evolving really quickly as well as we discussed earlier i think uh you know the one thing that maybe uh to to remember is that the considerations are robust however they are not exhaustive so i think you know they and they will as um i, I think it was um abby who mentioned you know they will vary from use case to use case so it is important that we do this if you like you know take the guidances take the considerations and kind of you know work with with, with them together rather than using only the considerations or um or vice versa so yeah i hope that's helpful thank you gracie um abby i'll turn back to you um are there specific considerations for different data sources boy that's a loaded question <laughs> um so so i think let, let's kind of go back to the to the basic concept that that real world data real world evidence is not the same category as randomized clinical trial right it, it is absolutely different and has different different markers in it so so each data source is going to have different associated documentation right it an insurance uh, database is not going to be the same as an external control arm it, it's just not um, so so understanding how the data is collected you know what what instance it was collected in who collected it under what standard of care when it was collected were there were there other specific kind of concurrent things going on in in the the standard of care space is really important to understand and then how is that data transferred or linked uh, to other data um, how is it adapted to answer a specific research question it, those are all important steps in deciding the type and extent um, of documentation that you need to prove that the real world data real world evidence is fit for purpose thank you Abby. and maybe and, and maybe just coming in on that i think what's what's really helpful is is kind of you know using this tool and adapting where needed because there is this level of if you like customization that also needs to happen per use case so you may find that the tool gives you some guidance on some of the documentation, but you may need additional guidance depending on on you know your where your use case is is um, uh, is, is going. So so just you know this um, you know this adaptation piece is really important as well. Alison, I'm going to pose a question for you. Um, can you discuss the use of data from non-interventional observational studies that were not originally intended to be used as part of a regulatory submission? Sure, I can definitely give my you know a take on it, and I welcome my fellow panelists to weigh in as well. I mean, I, you know, absolutely. I think if you look at the work in the paper, um, you know, it applies to a range of use cases, including including the secondary use of RWD from observational studies. So. It got kind of all the same considerations uh, should apply. Pretty straightforward. Yeah, and, and I'd like to caution any sponsor that's that's kind of thinking about secondary use, especially if they've got registries. Don't over-index just in case you might need it later. Do what you need to do and in order to get that registry data in and clean, um, and then think about what do you need to do in order to make sure that that a health authority understands the process by which you aggregate, aggregated that data into real world evidence. Um, it's super important not to not to put too many too many kind of barriers in your way to get, even just get patients on a registry. So, yeah. I also wanted to note something, which is that both EMA and FDA have guidance out right now about uh, the use of real world data in non-interventional studies and it's available for consultation so anyone could read the guidance and then submit comments so just wanted to add to what we're saying about uh, data quality and that you can look at those um, 
documents. One is, I'm sorry, one is a discussion paper or reflection paper from EMA. It's guidance from FDA. And you can think about um, where this kind of quality aspect fits in. Great. Um, I just want to do a, a time check here. We have about 15 minutes left in the webinar. So for any of the folks on the phone, if you have a question, please feel free to put those into the Q&A panel. Um, Allison, a question for you, since you have some background uh, in the Davis service provider space, do you think DSPs will find this considerations document helpful? So I'll answer this question um, from my previous role when I was at, was at Optum, where I spent um, three years leading strategy and product for Optum Life Sciences, which is a real world data and evidence provider. And just know that, you know, speaking from that perspective, I think the answer is yes. And I think that's also, um, you can attest to that from the responses to our survey. Um, this is given how important this is to sponsors, it's therefore very important to data service providers. You know, they, they want to be able to support, you know, their customers in this work. And so anything that helps them do so is going to be valuable uh, to them. I know that, again, speaking from my time there, um, we, you know, we were actively thinking and working on this and so would have found this valuable. Thanks, Allison. <laughs> I think um, one thing to add, though, just I mean, from that perspective, and I think you're hearing that this theme come across in a lot of these conversations. I wish there could be a more black and white or cookie cutter approach to this. You know, there's the checklist question and all of that. But, you, you know, you hear the word fit for purpose all the time. It's we're built, you know, we're building things to, to answer specific questions. And each data set um, and how it's acquired um, varies dramatically. And so you, you do need to think about these in a customized way. And I, I know that can be frustrating and be great to have a black and white answer on some of these things, but that is just unfortunately, it's not the world in which we operate and you know the, the standards which we have to hold ourselves to. And so um, you know that that is we've done the best that we can here, but you, inherently there's flexibility and variability in how you answer this depending on the question that you're asking and the data that you're then leveraging to answer that question. And each of that data is gonna be acquired in a different kind of way, right? And so I think you're seeing that reality reflected in the responses to these questions. And, and maybe just to come in on that, I think your comment just made me also think about, depending on the therapeutic area also, there is regulatory flexibility or not. So I think that's a key component as well. Like I, we know for rare diseases, it's hard to find the patients in registry. So, you know, there is a certain, um, I guess, degree of regulatory flexibility, whereas that's not there for the non-communicable diseases. So there's, you know, there's, a, there's that additional perspective of regulatory flexibility as well that we need to consider when we think about our, our use case. And just to add, I, FDA, EMA, MHRA all have stated out loud in their published papers that they welcome conversations, you know, use the official channels for conversations about what you plan to do, what your protocol um, is asking for, what data you might use, and talk to them about, you know, how do you overcome some of these challenges. I, I, I think, you know, as we as we talk about claims data as, as an avenue for real world evidence, um, it, it really it, it depends on your use case. Is it the only data that you're using to prove your point? Are there other things that you're doing in order to kind of shore up your conclusions? Um, there's there's so many different kind of layers to this um, that you you kind of have to answer. It's there's no one size fits all. There's no right answer. Um, this question maybe Nicole I'll ask you to start, but I imagine others might want to weigh in as well. Um, building on FDA's RWE guidance series, how do you see the overlap and the differences between the kinds of documentation that would be needed to assess whether um, a data set is fit for use versus what the FDA might ask to review for a, a data audit or inspection? You know, clearly this this tension around um, the reality of inspection and, and audit is is where we want to help folks navigate through. So with respect to the overlap between the kinds of documents that are needed to demonstrate that real world data are fit for use versus what a regulator may want to review in an inspection, I just have to reiterate that our 
considerations document was informed by regulatory guidance and frameworks to ensure the reliability and relevance of real world data and the integrity of the data for regulatory decision making. So these what's in our considerations document and what regulators may be asking for are aligned. And so I think that the considerations uh, that you have to think about, you have to have documentation to reflect um, the accrual, provenance, completeness, and accuracy of real world data, and really to understand the processes and procedures that are followed to give confidence and trust in the, in the data that it, there is integrity there and it is useful or fit for purpose for the specific use. Um, so I think that, you know, what we've tried to do is help show, um, help give you tools to show that a real world data source includes the data that's required to answer a specific question. So I think just taken together, the considerations will help inform whether the real world data are fit for purpose. Um, and they're also, as we have said many times on this, this uh, panel, it may not be exhaustive. So I think that sponsors really have to take that into account and then adjust their approach accordingly. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, Gracie, we have a question that came in to, for you. Um, I'm going to try to read this right. Um, we all know this is a, a, a newer, newer and evolving space. What challenges do you see within your organization with implementing this work product? Um, what are what are folks to do at a company to increase the knowledge around our WD or WE utility as opposed to limiting use? Oh, thanks for the question, and it's it's a, it's a great question. Um, so I think within each of our organisations, I guess you know we have the we have an opportunity to be you know if you're on this webinar, you're obviously kind of thinking about this. So you know please do reach out into your different organisations and and be an ambassador for 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 this tool. Um, and uh, you know so that's kind of growing awareness. Um, and I think you know. Um, we, you know, certainly within within Roche, we are trying very hard to have these discussions. You know, the points that were raised here to have the, you know, to use the tool as, um, you know, as a, as an opportunity to kind of discuss with the data service provider. Uh, you know, that these were the these are the considerations that that we need to need to think about when we are when we are um, looking at our use case. So that's kind of you know one uh, one. I guess tangible way, and then the other is really to use the um, the pathways that are being offered by the regulators, the early engagement. You know where they always talk about early engagement, and that I think is really really helpful because I think you know we we do get to we don't want to go so far down the line that actually we we've, we've got a complete completed. Uh, study and we're putting it in front of regulators. That's really not what they want to see. I think they want to be able to to understand, you know, our questions because it is it is tough, you know, when they think about um, when you know because they are kind of evaluating it from their particular lens. So I think there is this um, this almost I would say, you know, you, you're kind of um, working with them to help. To help them understand what you're bringing forward to to with them as well. So yeah, so these are some of the things that I think we are kind of working with within within our companies. Um, I mean, Nicole, you know, I'd, I'd, you know, it'd be great to hear from your perspective, Nicole and Abby, you know, what you guys think as well. The one thing that strikes me, um, in addition to what you said, which uh, I'm sure that Abby and I both agree with is that um, you need to make sure the right people are part of the conversation. And that includes people who are involved in um, establishing the relationships with data partners. You have to make sure that everyone is on the same page about what the regulatory ex expectations might be. And if any considerations are needed in terms of contracting or making sure that the information is available, um you know when needed for certain uses uh that has to all be in place so i think it's helpful to be an ambassador share the information that's available about regulatory expectations use all the tools necessary to try to ensure um, that you can have a, a productive conversation with data partners 
um, and then make sure the right people are at the table. And that's what we're trying to do. I completely and I think, agree on that one. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no problem. I, I, I think the one thing I, I would add is make sure that you're really clear on what you want to do up front. You know, it, it is absolutely, um, it, it's breathtaking when you absolutely have a hypothesis that you move forward and, and you answer all those questions as you go. Um, don't try to do it at the end, but yeah. I think we're all guilty of the the drift this <laughs> week, you know, where you think, oh, you know, this study could be used in many different ways. So yeah, no, it's a really good call out. Thanks, Abby. Well, I think we got a great question here, and from one of our attendees, um, as one of the vendors being engaged to solve our WE and AI for FDA, how can we ensure your ideas are part of FDA solutions? being engineered. And I'm, I'm not sure if, who wants to take that. I don't know if Allison, you want to take us uh, take a stab at that one? Sure, I can speak broadly. And then I will have, you know, I think the um, the folks that led this work speak specifically to this, is we actively engage with the FDA to share with them what we're working on. Um, it's one of the unique things that we can do as Transcelerate is, rep you know, represent the voice of sponsors broadly. Um, and that's what we've done, I believe, with this work. Um, and we will continue to do as we push similar um, initiatives forward is, um, the FDA is always willing to hear what we are working on and the perspectives and the solutions we're coming up um, coming up with. I, I suspect that um, FDA and uh, industry or other stakeholders are on the same page uh, in a number of ways, including, um, you know, the kind of AI tools that might be used to, let's say, extract unstructured, <clears throat> excuse me, information from electronic health records. And I think. Um, having opportunities for stakeholders to come together and talk about the needs and how to ensure that these kind of tools are trustworthy would be really important to do. And, and just specific to this paper, I mean, the FDA was invited to comment on it and they're aware of our paper. I mean, just to be super direct, but speaking broadly with all of our work, we engage regulators globally um, in it. Great, thank you. Um, think. I would say, are there any closing comments from our panelists? We have maybe just one or two minutes for some closing comments. Okay. Well, with that, um, I want to thank everyone for the great discussion today. And truly thanks to all who submitted questions, um, really made this work prepping for this webinar quite easy because we, we knew where the interests were lying.